We're back. We're back. We're back. It's been a busy couple of weeks. I've missed you all, and I'm excited to bring this episode, this daily tear sheet to you. Just want to get a couple of updates and a little bit of housekeeping in order. Guest spotlights, expect guest spotlights to start dropping again this week. We've got a three-part series all about the local seller, how to endure uh, kind of recessionary times. So if you are boots on the ground pulling doors, this is something you're not going to want to miss. Three-part series, that's going to kick off this Thursday, first of three installments there. We've got more daily episodes coming, but maybe the most exciting thing on the docket and a large part of the reason I've been mostly out of pocket the last two weeks is we are getting ready for our first public product launch at one screen. That's going to be this Wednesday, August 3rd. So figure on something. Maybe I'll do like some sort of live stream or or do something like that. Maybe we can get some folks on and do some live product demo or some fun stuff like that, but ultimately we're going to be launching a whole bunch of free software tools for media owners, things that are going to help you to operate your business in a more modern way and uh, and more for that to follow later this week. So stay tuned, keep an eye on the wire. We'll definitely cover it here later this week. But for today, we're going to talk about Disney. We're going to talk about the trade desk, more of this vertical integration, the Netflix and Microsoft Xander thing, uh, Hive Stack. How does all this ultimately shake out? Disney struck an advertising agreement with the Trade Desk, making it possible for brands to target automated ads across Disney's linear and streaming properties. Hulu, ESPN Plus, ABC, Freeform, ESPN, National Geographic, and FX. The news comes in advance of Disney's launch of an ad-supported tier for its flagship service, Disney Plus which would likely become another such target of such a deal. All right. So this is in addition to the ad supported version of Disney plus. So there's even still more money on the table for Disney ad properties. Previously, Disney kept Hulu's ad inventory separate from its other properties. So this partnership means advertisers can not only discover more addressable inventory across Disney's portfolio, they can also now programmatically target their audiences, and potentially improve the return on investment. Disney has previously said it wants to automate 50% of its business by 2026. At last year, 2021, at last year's upfront advertising sales event, over 40% of the ad inventory Disney sold was automated. So for anyone concerned about programmatic taking your job, this is Disney, and they're saying only 50% of their ad business would be automated by 2026, and that still requires people to support uh, to to some degree. So if you're concerned about programmatic coming for you, you can probably stop worrying. In fact, it used to be that Google ads, the little paid search ad units at the top of the results page when you search, they used to be sold directly by humans. The automated bidding thing was just a test that an engineer wanted to try. And what they found was that by creating an auction for ad space, it drove rates up more than 60% because you create the conditions for market efficiency. So All this automation is going to make every piece of of out-of-home more valuable, not just the digital inventory. And I saw some ridiculous article the other day about programmatic cheapening digital out-of-home because that's what happened to display ads. There's one really important difference here. Display ads have no intrinsic value and are nearly infinite. Out-of-home is exactly the opposite. Our intrinsic value is the street corner we're on whether that be Main Street or Times Square, it's the size, it's the shape, it's the context, it's what you can do with the screen, it's all of those things. It's literally what you make of it. It's real estate in the real world that is your brand's canvas for creating a moment in the physical buyer's journey. And the fact of the matter is, we've got a limited quantity. This, coming out of the drum.com, 10% of US programmatic ad spend is wasted on made-for-advertising sites. This is in addition to the 20% or 17% of CTV that's going TV's turned off. Study found that almost 10% of programmatic ad spend in the U.S. goes to low-quality, low-value websites designed to trick advertisers, according to a study from Ubiquity. The research demonstrates that a sizable proportion of all ad spend among among its clients land on made-for-advertising or MFA content sites. So what is an MFA or made for advertising website? We've all landed on them before. They look like periodicals, but online. They're full of clickbaity titles and no real content. 
It usually takes a minute or two before you realize you're trapped in some maze of weird nonsense. But that's an MFA, and 10% of programmatic ad spend is ending up there because demand-side platforms love them for delivering, and I'm using quote fingers here, above-average results based on viewability. Sound familiar? Sound like the IAB guidance that influenced the recent OAAA updated impression measurement guidance? Here's the only problem. Just because the trade body says that viewability should be the favored attribute of positive performance doesn't mean that's what marketers actually think. Have you ever driven down one of those roads that just has one billboard after another after another? It's this seemingly endless dystopia of meaningless roadside billboards that you stop paying attention to. It's basically the equivalent of, of an MFA in the real world. And just because the viewability, rather the opportunity to see, is really good doesn't make it a high-quality ad experience that drives business outcomes. Marketers value context and content. And the study goes on to say that of the marketers polled, 39% said they cut spending with a major platform last year. So how are brands responding? Brands are being advised to create a clear overview of supply partners and where their ad spend ends up. In addition to reallocating spend to partners that align with value and have demonstrated responsible practices where necessary. So it's not just about viewability anymore, which makes it feel like as an industry, out of home is just always a step ahead, trying to play catch up to digital, when in reality, we're playing an entirely different game. Brands aren't asking us for parity with digital. They are asking us to confidently show them how to find their audiences offline, to help them navigate the investment in the formats appropriate for their brand, budget, and goal, and ultimately a partner in helping them optimize their feedback loop to ours. Disney just did a record $9 billion in their upfronts this year. They sold the equivalent of all out-of-home domestically here in the United States in their annual opportunity for brands to secure inventory in advance across all of their ad properties. Despite that, Out of Home continues to argue about bulletins versus wrapped cars or which is better. And, and, and all the while, there's so much money available in the market. We're literally stepping over dollars and arguing about dimes. So let's double down on what makes being a real-world brand so appealing in a digitally exhausted world by creating relevant brand experiences for audiences who care in a way that's predictably scalable. All right, that's it. That's my soliloquy for today. Make sure to subscribe and follow wherever you're getting this. And remember, share of voice equals share of mind and share of mind equals share of market. So when you say something, make it count.